Hi guys and welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. If you're new here, my name is Zara and I post a new true crime video every single week. So if you love makeup and you love true crime, definitely hit that like button, hit that notification bell button and consider subscribing guys would mean so much to me. So most people know Jeffrey Dahmer. He is one of the most publicized and even romanticized serial killers. Jeffrey Dahmer was out killing freely for more than a decade from the years 1978 to 1991. He preyed mainly on black, Asian, and Latino men and young boys. In 2022, Netflix made a show about Dahmer. And I mean, I, along with millions of other people have seen that show, but the one victim I just couldn't get out of my mind was Conorak Synthesophone. He was only 14 years old when he crossed paths with Jeffrey. And I feel like due to the show, what happened to him has kind of become more well known. And a lot of people are compelled to learn about Jeffrey. I get it. His story is wild. But I was more compelled to find out more about Conorak, about his family, what happened to him, how the police failed him. And I wanted to share whatever we do know. Before we get into it, I wanted to thank today's sponsor, June's Journey. June's Journey is a hidden object murder mystery game that is set back in the glamorous 1920s era. You play as Detective June Parker, who was on a mission to solve the murder of her sister and along the way uncovers many family secrets. In each level, you find hidden objects which lead to collecting clues to help you solve the mystery. Apart from it being a murder mystery game, which I obviously love, one of my favorite parts is finding the hidden objects and cleaning up each scene. I think that's the mom in me. I also love the beautiful scenery and imagery, but hands down, my favorite part has got to be decorating my own island where June lives. I mean, a lot of you guys may know that Jay and I are almost done building our new home and home decor has got to be one of my favorite things in the world. But in June's journey, I can decorate however I want, whenever I want. And if I don't like something, I can just pick it up and move it to where I think it looks better. Each scene is so intricately designed, so colorful and detailed. I usually play right before bed after my kids are asleep and I find it so relaxing to just wind down, find these hidden objects. And I'm a very tense person. So when I play June's Journey, I get to just zone out, not worry about every little thing I have to do. And I can just have a little me time. You can download June's Journey for free, guys, by clicking on the link below in my description box. June's Journey is available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. Thank you so much to June's Journey for sponsoring today's video. And thank you so, so much to you guys for all your continued support, because this is all possible thanks to you. Okay, back to today's case. Conorak Synthesymphone, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He was born on 1st of December, 1976 in Laos, and his father, Sun Thorn, was a rice farmer in Laos. He had two older brothers. One was named Somsak and one was named Anouk, I believe. And in the 1970s, communist forces overthrew the monarchy. And his father, Sun Thorn, remember he was a rice farmer, so he had some land. And when the country then tried to take over his land, Sun Thorn was like, okay, well, I need to get my family out of here. So in March 1979, Sun Thorn and his wife took, well, Sun Thorn took his entire family and he puts them on a canoe. And then in the middle of the night, he sends them off on the Mekong River from Laos to Thailand to escape. So Sun Thon and his wife, they actually drugged the three boys with sleeping pills. And that was so that they wouldn't wake up or cry and make any noise and alert any of the soldiers along the river. And from what I read, Sun Thon did not get on this canoe with his family. And I don't know exactly why. Maybe there wasn't enough room. Maybe there was another reason. But apparently the next night, Sun Thon himself, he swam across the Mekong River from Laos to Thailand. Like, that's how he got there. Crazy. It's just the fact that people have to even flee their own homes and the fact that it's even happening in today's world. I know it's a whole different topic, but it's just so sad and it's one of the scariest things to me. I feel horrible for those people. So when Sun Thorn joined his family in Thailand, they lived in Thailand in a refugee camp 
for one year before they were relocated to Wisconsin, America with the help of this Catholic program. And this Catholic program was an American-based um, program and they helped this family relocate to Wisconsin and they began living there in the year 1980. And that would not have been easy moving to America, like a completely Western country. It would have not been easy for that entire family, three children. But this family, they worked hard, they learned English and they assimilated into the Western culture. So as they were becoming assimilated into their American way of life, the older brothers would take on jobs to support the parents and to help them earn some money for the family. They would work as welders, machinists, assembly line workers. And although life was not easy, they did feel it was a better life in the U.S., compared to that they would have had back at home in Laos. So this family was just living their life. Everything was going really well for them until eight years later when they would cross paths with Jeffrey Dahmer. So I believe in the neighborhood where Jeffrey either lived or where he would just kind of frequent, the Conorak boys, they would hang out in the streets here and there. Now, I'm not exactly sure what the kids were doing you know, on the streets, but I'm just, I, I think they were just hanging out with their friends, just doing what kids do. And again, the Synthes of Phone family, they did struggle with their finances. So the boys would try to help out wherever they could. And especially Conorak and Somsak, they would try and pick up odd jobs here and there just to make a couple of extra bucks on the side for their family. Now on one of these occasions, and I'm sure Jeffrey had seen these kids hanging around from time to time, he approaches Somsak, who was 13 years old at the time. It was the year 1988. And he approaches Somsak and he says, you know, I'll give you some money if you come and work for me. The job was to pose nude for Jeffrey and let Jeffrey take some photos of him. At this time, it's allege that Jeffrey, he had just moved out of his grandmother's house and moved into his own apartment. Now Somsak, he was in need of money and he was persuaded by Jeffrey to accompany him back to his apartment to take these nude photos in exchange for money. Once Somsak was inside the home, Jeffrey possibly offered Somsak something to drink and it was then that he was drugged and SA'd while in Jeffrey's home. Now, thankfully, Somsak was able to escape because he could have very easily just been one of Jeffrey's murder victims. Now, if you guys have seen the Netflix show, the show portrays Jeffrey as still living in his grandmother's house. And what's happening is he, Jeffrey seems drunk, like intoxicated, and he's following Somsak out of the house because Somsak's stumbling out of the ho house because he's also drugged. And as he's stumbling out of the home, um, Jeffrey's like calling out to him and saying, you know, come back and he'll pay him $50. And it seems that as Somsak is stumbling out of the home, Jeffrey's almost about to get him and grab him back into the home. But as he's doing that, his grandmother, because remember he's in his grandmother's house in the show, his grandmother knocks on an upstairs window and gets his attention. And then Jeffrey like looks at her and he's like, oh, and that's, he just lets Somsak get away. But like I said before, Jeffrey had been living in his own apartment. So I don't know which part is true, whether the Netflix show was just, that was their adaptation of it. But what I believe from what I've read is that Somsak escaped Jeffrey's apartment and possibly he was able to escape because Jeffrey was too intoxicated at the time to stop him. The show then portrays Somsak stumbling home. And in his home, there's like a bunch of people and everyone's like, where were you? Because he was obviously missing for a while. And his parents are calling out to him saying, where were you? Where were you? And he just stumbles up into his bedroom and he like falls on his bed. And then his parents come to him and then they quickly realize he's not himself. Something's not right. And that's when they call the police and report what happened to Somsak. Now, once Jeffrey was reported and the police learned about what happened to Somsak on 27th September 1988, they arrest Jeffrey 
And then at his January 1989 court hearing, Jeffrey pled guilty to second degree sexual assault, as well as tempting a child for immoral reasons, which sometimes you have to wonder the, who writes these things? So for this crime, he was given a sentence of five years probation, as well as one year at a work release camp in May of that same year. And then the judge also asked Jeffrey to register as a sex offender. And then although he was sentenced to one year at this work release camp, he was released two months early from this camp because he wrote a letter to the judge claiming, you know, he regrets his actions and how guilty he felt, et cetera, et cetera. And then he was able to move into this Milwaukee apartment in May of 1990. Now in this apartment, even though he had regular appointments with his probation officer, that year in 1990, he would go on to commit four more murders. And then the following year in 1991, he would go on to commit eight more murders. It's wild. Now, this is something that happens a lot, and it did happen to the Synthesis Phone family. They were not notified about Dahmer's early release from this work camp. And according to Conrad's older brother, Anouk, he stated that Conrad did not even know Dahmer by name or even like what he looked like. And I don't know if that's because during the time that Jeffrey was tried for the crime against Somsack, was Conrad just not present in court or maybe his family just never told Conrad who Jeffrey was or, you know, what he looked like. And he would have been a lot younger at the time too. Then just a couple years later, on May 26th, 1991, Jeffrey meets Conorak in a Milwaukee mall. Now, when Jeffrey approached Conorak, Conorak had no idea who he was. He didn't recognize him at all. And Conorak's family was still, you know, not doing well on the financial front. So when Jeffrey offers him money, Conorak obviously was quite enticed by this. Once again, Jeffrey offers Conorak, Somsack's younger brother, money if he would come back to his apartment to pose for a nude photo shoot. Conorak reluctantly agrees to this. And at the time, he was actually due to go to his soccer practice in Mitchell Park, but he would miss this to go and join Jeffrey and get money. Now, the promise of money and alcohol too is what enticed Conorak to go ahead with this man he didn't know. I mean, he was so young. He was 14 years old. And I read online a lot of people saying, you know, well, you knew what happened to your brother. Why did you, why did you go? And, you know, the, the offer was so similar. But I think kids, especially when it comes to money, they just don't, they don't realize how bad a situation can be. And if someone seems fine, you trust it. And I think he probably just thought, I'm going to go here, earn a quick buck and then leave, you know, like it's not a big deal. But Conorak, once he went to Dahmer's apartment, this quick photo shoot turned into a nightmare. At first, Dahmer did exactly what he said he was going to do. He just took some photos of Conorak in his underwear. However, what Conorak did not know is that this was only stage one of Dahmer's horrific plan. Conorak was in this apartment completely unaware of who he was in the presence of. The same man who assaulted his own brother just three years earlier. And keep in mind, Jeffrey was on probation this whole time. He was still seeing his probation officer this entire time. Once Dahmer had Conorak back in his apartment, he gave him a drink, which was basically a concoction of crushed up sleeping pills. These sleeping pills made Conorak unconscious. And before I go on, obviously a warning that what I'm about to describe is quite graphic. I'm going to try and not use all the words, but it's still graphic nonetheless. Once he drugged him, Jeffrey then proceeded to this young unconscious boy. But that wasn't all he wanted. And I have a feeling this next part, which is, you know, one of the most craziest things about this whole case, 
But I feel like the reason why he did this to Conorak is because it was sort of an experiment because he was a younger boy. He was smaller than him and possibly more easier to control, not only physically, but I think mentally he could tell him certain things that maybe an adult wouldn't believe. So after doing those horrific things to this young boy, Jeffrey then pulls out a drill and he proceeds to drill a hole into this young boy's skull. And he claimed that he drilled a hole that was just enough to open up a passageway to his brain. Jeffrey then injected hydrochloric acid into the frontal lobe portion of Conorak's brain, which would induce this zombie-like state. When Conorak regained consciousness, he didn't seem to react to much. He was in this dazed state. And that also included a decomposing body that was in Jeffrey's bedroom. He just didn't react. Now, obviously following this, Jeffrey was like, well, my plan worked. His victim is not resisting. His victim does not seem to know what's going on. And he's satisfied that he has incapacitated his victim. So Jeffrey then decides to leave Conorak in his apartment and go down to the local bar. He left Conorak alone, naked and unguarded. So when Jeffrey left Conorak, he wakes up and he realizes he's in this drug induced state and he's naked. But what's crazy to me is that even in this state, having a hole drilled into the front of your skull, having acid injected into it, Conorak still saw a chance to be free. Conorak managed to escape the apartment, escape the building, and even make it as far out the door into North 25th Street. And as he was fleeing, he was then spotted by his neighbors, well, Jeffrey's neighbors, and their names were Sandra Smith, Tina Spivy, and Nicole Childress. And these three women, when they saw Conorak, they immediately knew something was wrong. Now, Sandra Smith, she was the daughter of of Glenda Cleveland, which if you know anything about Jeffrey Dahmer, you'll know who she is. She was actually Jeffrey's neighbor, but in the Netflix show, they portray her as his immediate neighbor, like next door neighbor. But I believe she lived in a completely separate apartment building to Jeffrey. And over the course of Jeffrey living in that apartment, she had reported him numerous times to the police. And I don't know how this affected her, but Glenda, along with a few other neighbors would report Jeffrey claiming that there was this foul smell coming from his apartment as well as strange noises at all hours of the night. For the few people that would complain directly to Jeffrey about this foul smell coming from his apartment, he would tell them all sorts of wild stories. He would say, you know, or oh, I bought a bunch of meat, you know, some pork chops and they're rotting, you know, I forgot to throw them out or he had some tropical fish that had died and that's where the smell was coming from. And unfortunately for a lot of the victims, most people believed Jeffrey's lies. So I believe when these three women saw Conorak, maybe they called Glenda, but Glenda was allegedly present also at the scene and she was already highly suspicious of Dahmer. Now Glenda, she sees this naked teenage boy running away from Dahmer's apartment in the early hours of the morning confused, scared, disoriented. She immediately was like, this isn't right. And she called the police. Then unfortunately, which really just is so unfortunate and just the worst timing, Dahmer is now on his way back to his apartment after drinking at the bar. And what does he see near his building? Conorak being comforted by these women. Now, Jeffrey, he knew that these women knew something was off. Something was horribly wrong. And Conorak, he was fluent in English, but in his dazed and disoriented state, he was just speaking broken Laotian. And I think what's really sad to me, especially, is that even though he is so disoriented, he is so distressed. So now Dharma seeing what's happening outside his apartment, he decides to approach the women who are comforting Conorak and he begins calling Conorak a different name and telling the women, you know, Conorak's just my lover and he's under my care and he tries to physically take Conorak away from these women, but they 
pushed him away and they were like, no, police are coming. He's going to stay right here with us. And Jeffrey now realizing, okay, if I protest too much, it could go horribly wrong. So he says, fine, fine, we'll wait for the police. But he keeps sort of insisting that Conorak is with him by choice. The responding officers were John Balserzak and Joseph Gabrish. And when they arrived on the scene, they see this boy who's naked, bleeding, and heavily drugged. So now, obviously, Jeffrey, he begins explaining himself to the police, and he tells them that the boy was his 19-year-old lover. To explain to the officers why Conorak was in this disoriented state, he claims that the boy is drunk and the blood that was on him had come from a skinned knee. He tells everyone there that Conorak had become drunk during a fight that had taken place and that he often acts this way when he's upset. He then tells the police, you know, I can take care of Conorak back at my apartment. And look, Conorak was heavily drugged at this point and he was leaning on Dahmer. He wasn't trying to get away from him because he was so drugged. And because of this, the police were pretty calm about the whole situation. They were just trying to like understand what was going on. And you know, Dharma speaking so calmly and explaining the situation, not panicking. I'm sure that also put the officers at ease. Then a third officer, Richard Porobkan, joins them at this point. And now as the police are there and trying to understand and figure out what to do next, Dharma goes on to tell them that him and Conorak were just homosexual lovers who had gotten into an argument after having too many drinks that night. The police believed Jeffrey and noted this incident down as a domestic squabble between homosexuals. Now, remember the three women, they're still there. They're arguing. They're going, this doesn't seem right. Despite them protesting, the police then escort a super vulnerable and mentally weak Conorak back with Dahmer to his apartment. Once they're back in the apartment, Dahmer then pulls out the photographs that he had taken of Conorak the previous day. And he's showing them like, see, you know, we're lovers. See, we took these photos. You know, this was the evidence that we're together. And the police even noticed a foul smell in the apartment, but the police failed to investigate anything and they left. I mean, the whole situation is so fishy. I don't understand how, you know, the police didn't even think to look. Just sending anybody back intoxicated without really knowing, no identification, no nothing. Like, what were they thinking? Then the officers have to call back to the station to report on the incident. And one of the officers says, and it's caught on recording, my partner and I are going to get deloused at the station. As the cops laughed about this situation, 60 minutes after the police helped Jeffrey bring Conorak back into his apartment, Conorak was dead. After the police left, (sighs) Jeffrey then upped Conorak's dosage. He injected even more hydrochloric acid into the hole in his skull. But this time, the amount he injected was enough to kill Conorak. Jeffrey then reportedly... S.A. Conorak prior to injecting him after the police left and after injecting him. Then Jeffrey takes the next 24 hours off work, you know, because he needed time to dismember Conorak's body along with another body that was still in his apartment. This other body was that of Tony Hughes. He then takes Conorak's dismembered body parts and he stores them in acid. He stored, I believe, the entire body of Conorak in this acid container, but he did keep his skull separate just in his apartment by itself. If the officers just took a couple more steps into his apartment, they would have noticed the body of Tony Hughes just in the bedroom. Dahmer had killed Tony just three days earlier. If they had done a background search, checked his criminal history, they would have found that Dahmer had just been convicted of committing this crime against Conorak's brother, Somtak. He was listed as a child molester just out of jail. They didn't even inspect Conorak thoroughly. They didn't 
get a medical examination for him. And most of all, they ignored these women who were protecting Conorak and trying to help him. When the girls insisted that Conorak was in danger, the police ignored them. And they even ignored, the police even ignored these women when the women said that they had seen Conorak around the neighborhood and he was a boy that had been missing for nearly a full day. The police tell these women it's a domestic dispute and they should just leave it alone. Glenda then contacts the FBI to alert them about Jeffrey's behavior, but again, she was ignored. After Conorak, Jeffrey would go on to kill four more men. Years later, but even back then, many claim that it was racism that played a part in the cops ignoring these witnesses because these witnesses, these women, they were black. The police, they made up their mind about sending Conorak back, even though it seemed that he did not want to go and return with Jeffrey. Honestly, rather than doing their job as policemen and using this sign as something was wrong, they decided to forcefully take this boy back in to this apartment that they didn't even know that he was actually from. It's claimed that even though he was just muttering incoherently, Conorak was actually protesting. And I really believe this because if he had the mental capacity to try and escape, I really believe he probably had the mental capacity to show some form of protesting. I'm sure if you were actually at the scene, if you were actually witnessing this, any reasonable person would have just known something was not right. Whether he was 19, whether he was younger, do you really send an incapacitated person, even if they're drunk, they're bleeding. They can't communicate. They can't even confirm that that's their home. Do you really send them back to an essentially unknown place? Even if he was drunk, do you send someone to be in the care of someone without any proof that that someone is related to the person that is drunk? It just really doesn't make sense to me. And I wonder what was really happening at the time. And the officers claimed that the mumbling that they could hear, they just believed it to be Conorak speaking in Laotian. And as this is going on, as he's mumbling, as he's protesting, the witnesses are just looking on with horror. Nicole, she was 17 years old at the time. I want to read a quote. She states, he was struggling. He was reaching out to me for help. We tried to give the policeman our names, but he just told us to butt out. I couldn't understand why he wouldn't want our names. I said, what are you going to do about this? This is a boy. And let's not forget Glenda Cleveland. She was a woman of color living in a low socioeconomic area, right? And she also had a really tough time being taken seriously by the police. They just dismissed all her concerns and her reports. And not to mention, if you listen to Glenda's um, police calls, right? She sounds genu like genuinely concerned. She legit sounds a bit afraid even and like something is not right it's like she knew something was just not right her her calls did not seem like she was wasting time and you know if only they had listened jeffrey dahmer was finally arrested on 22nd july 1991 when another one of his potential victims tracy edwards managed to escape his apartment and flag down police when his apartment was searched Police found the remains of 11 separate victims, including Conorak. What the police saw in Jeffrey's apartment probably scared the crap out of them, but it shocked them. Not only did they find photographic evidence, right, because he took so many freaking photos, they also found the remains of those 11 victims just dissolving, like different body parts just dissolving in acid. They found drugs for sedating these victims. And then they also found photographs of just dismembered body parts in Jeffrey's filing cabinet. They found three preserved skulls and one of them was Conorak. Now, when Jeffrey was captured, many were left wondering how the hell did this happen? How, how the hell did he get away with all of this for so long? There was plenty of evidence against him and plenty of reports made against him, but he still did all this. The news of Conorak's death shook the community and it also prompted an investigation into how 
the police actually handled that case. The Synthes and Foreign family was informed that Conorak's remains were found, but they waited for weeks for it to actually be sent to them for his burial. During this time, the family decided to file a lawsuit not only against Jeffrey, but against the police force and the city of Milwaukee for the negligence towards their son, Conorak. Those two officers, John Bolserzak and Joseph Gabrish, they were fired from the police force in December of 1992 um, due to their terrible police work. They were accused of not doing their jobs properly and they actually had this four-week hearing that involved 27 witnesses, 90 hours of testimony, and reviewing a 1,000 pages of evidence. They were accused of failing to positively identify Conorak, thoroughly listen to the witnesses present at the scene, or call their superiors for advice in relation to this incident. As information came out about these two officers, their actions and the way they handled this case received a great deal of scrutiny and the recordings of them making those homophobic remarks after sending Conrad back with Jeffrey were leaked. You know, the remark about how they now needed to be deloused after being in the presence of these gay men and also the fact that they just ignored Glenda Cleveland's concerns and reports. After the police left, Glenda called the police six more times insisting that Conorak was in danger. Even with all of this, the officers made notes and argued, stating that the boy didn't speak English, nothing seemed amiss, and they felt no need to check for any IDs. I have a quote from one of the officers, Joseph Gabrish. He said, I wish there had been some other piece of evidence or information available to us. We handle the call the way we felt it should have been handled. He also said they didn't bother to look into Jeffrey's background because of how cooperative, you know, he was during this whole altercation. They also tried to claim that they were being sensitive to this homosexual relationship, but the commission did not buy that. Dahmer introduced Conorak to the police as John Mong, and the police failed to verify this, failed to check if this was even correct, if this was even his real name. The commission noted that these two officers, they were known as the Iron Men, and they violated police rules 15 times in their investigation into this case, which lasted only for 16 minutes. These officers failed to verify Dahmer's identity. They failed to check on John Hong's address, age, his real name. They didn't check any of this, no background checks. They failed to verify his age. They failed to give him a medical assessment. And it's also claimed that these two officers also waved off an emergency medical team. These officers just failed at everything. They also failed to verify Glenda Cleveland's information. She actually called the officers later. Remember, she called them multiple times. And one of the times she stated she remembers Conorak because when her children were young, Conorak would play with them as a child. That alone would make you think that Conorak wasn't that old. And I think the Netflix series only showed two of the officers responding to Jeffrey's call, but there was also that third officer, Richard Porobkin. A few years after this commission probe, these two officers, uh, Balsarzak and Gabrish, they actually appealed what happened to them. They appealed them being fired. And in 1994, guess what happened? A judge ruled that what happened to these two officers was too severe and they were reinstated into the police force and they also got $55,000 of back pay each each, each. This poor family, not only did they have to endure it once with Somsak, they had to endure it twice with Conorak. After the horrific trauma that this family had to endure at the hands of Jeffrey Dahmer, they claimed that the police failed to uphold Conorak's constitutional rights, his right to equal protection of the law, and that they based this on his race, his sex, and his sexual identity. The family didn't just state that the police failed to protect Conorak from Jeffrey. The full accusation was they alleged that, among other things, the officers actively pre prevented private citizens from helping Conorak and, in fact, delivered Conorak, who was a minor at the time, 
not to his parents, but into the custody of Jeffrey Dahmer, his murderer. All of this is from the Chief Justice's decision, so I don't want to mess any of it up because the allegations were not just of police inaction, but of police action, right? Like that's very specific police action that violated Conorak's rights. So the officers asked for the family's claim that they violated due process to be dismissed from the case due to the fact that they had immunity because they were police officers. So the due process claim was dismissed by the judge, but the judge did not dismiss the violation of Conorak's equal protection rights from the case. So the case went to trial in March of 1995, and by April of 1995, the city agreed to settle and agreed to pay the family $850,000. The Synthesophone family greatly struggled with Conorak's death, and they claimed that they felt numb over the matter, with his father even claiming that coming to America was a mistake in the first place, that he escaped the communists for this to happen. Jeffrey Dahmer served his time at the Columbia Correctional Institute in Portage, Portage, Wisconsin. And during his time in prison, he expressed remorse for his crimes and wished death upon himself for his crimes. He also began reading the Bible and claimed that he was a born-again Christian. Now, he was attacked twice in prison. The first time he was attacked um, with a knife to his neck and he managed to escape this with just superficial wounds. The second time he was attacked was on November 28th, 1994, while he was cleaning the prison showers with another inmate. Now, Jeffrey was found alive, but on his way to the hospital, he died from severe head trauma. Now, if you want to learn more about Jeffrey's story and his background, Bailey Sarian has a very good video on it. I think she goes into a lot of detail. I watched it years ago, so I don't really remember, but I just remember it was a really good video. So if you want to know more about Jeffrey, I'm sure you guys have already seen that video, but if you haven't, she, she's got a really good video. I mean, we know Jeffrey Dahmer had many victims, but Conorak's story in particular is so upsetting because the police literally handed him to his killer. I just can't fathom or believe that in the moment that the police were with Jeffrey and Conorak, I, I know serial killers and, you know, killers can be very charming and very, you know, put on a show, but there was nothing off about the situation, nothing at all. Did the homosexuality make the officers uncomfortable? Was it racism playing a part? It's hard to believe it didn't, right? I mean, why weren't Glenda's calls taken seriously? Maybe she was always calling about Jeffrey and, you know, she didn't have any evidence. Maybe that's what they could claim, but did they ever come at all to investigate? Couple that with the fact that her nieces and daughter called the police when they saw Conorak. Police came but failed to really investigate. There was no point in them really being there. If they, I feel like if they hadn't even come, maybe Conorak wouldn't have gone back with Jeffrey. If, if the women were protecting him, it seemed like they weren't going to let him go back with Jeffrey. This whole case is so upsetting and it feels like Jeffrey definitely targeted this family. Was he upset that Somsak had gotten away? He felt like he needed to get at least one of them. Who knows what goes through these freaking people's minds. The family wasn't even aware of Jeffrey's release. Like that's the craziest thing to me. This poor boy. I mean, the things that Jeffrey did to him. I mean, we talk about it, but if we really think about it, it, it truly is the most sick and evil behavior of a human being to do this to another person. It's torture, torture that was inflicted on these poor men. Let me know your thoughts on today's case, guys. I hope you enjoyed today's video and I will see you in the next one. Besitos. Bye. Thank you once again to June's Journey for sponsoring today's video. And don't forget, guys, you can download the game for free by clicking on the link in the description box below.